This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm Sarah Talia. With their striking feathers and distinctive call, black cockatoos are easily recognised by many Australians. These iconic birds are native to Australia, and Western Australia is home to three of five species of black cockatoo. But these charismatic and adaptable birds are expected to be extinct by 2050 due to major habitat loss. In this episode, I was joined by Bill Bateman and Jane Hammond. Bill Bateman is a professor in the School of Molecular and Life Sciences at Curtin University, and Jane Hammond is an award-winning filmmaker. We spoke about why our black cockatoos are in crisis and what Australia can do to better conserve its native flora and fauna. If you'd like to find out more about this topic, you can visit the links provided in the show notes. Firstly, Bill, can you tell us a little bit about our black cockatoos here in Western Australia, the types, their habitat, their characteristics, and the role they actually play in our environment? Yeah, so we've got, in Australia, there's five species of black cockatoo, but in Western Australia, we've got three of them. And we've got the uh, red-tailed black cockatoo and then two white-tailed black cockatoos. And for a long time, the two white-tails were thought to be the same species, but now we separate them into carnabies and bodans. And it's quite difficult to tell the difference between the carnabies and the bodans, uh, unless you're a real cockatoo expert, and then you can become quite confident, in that, which, doesn't, which wouldn't necessarily include me about in the field. Uh, slightly different call, uh, the Bodens has a long, longer top beak, um, and these are big majestic birds. They're loud and dramatic, uh, all three species, and uh, they feed on a variety of things, but um, mostly sort of nuts and seeds and banksias, and also some uh, insects, some bugs, sort of big, big grubs, which they get out of uh, wood. Um, and there are... Uh, one of our sort of major parrots here in the southwest so certainly anyone who's familiar with them will know that they will carry gum nuts around and drop them in other places so they're spreading seeds they're almost certainly implicated in pollinating banksias when they go down and chew on banksia plants um, so they're hugely important though we don't necessarily need to find an importance for them we just should keep them because they're wonderful animals but yeah, here in the southwest, we're particularly lucky in having three of these these magnificent birds. Jane, we've just heard about some of the importance of these beautiful creatures that you already love and understand as well, but they're predicted to become extinct, the WA black cockatoo, by 2050. Why is that? Oh, look, even sooner than 2050, much sooner. When the, um, the you know, first analysis was out that um, they were going to be gone in 20 years, that was um, you know, quite a few years ago now, so we're well down that track and nothing much has changed. Um, basically, it's, well, it's a, a number of factors that are impacting on these birds, uh, the biggest one being habitat loss. So we are losing so much of these birds' habitat uh, to development, uh, to mining in the forests, uh, you know, to, to the unrelenting march of, of sub suburbanism across our you know, Bankshire woodlands, and now, we have a critical point with the Nangara pine plantation north of Perth where these birds have come, become reliant on, on these uh, pine plantations and they will all be gone within a couple of years. Uh, attempts to stop that by Curtin University, by Dr Hugh Finn through the EPA to get a review. Um, that's a long running story but it's, the EPA has just announced um, about last week that it will review the changing land, land use and, and try and attempt, you know, because of public pressure to, um, to save these pines for the birds. But they won't do that until next year. And then that itself might take a year. So by the time they come to a decision and say, oops, perhaps we should have kept these pines, they'll be well and truly gone. So it's thing after thing after thing that we're seeing these birds impacted by and it's it's a tragedy it's a, it's a tragedy that we're, we're watching they slide into extinction and our government's doing nothing what is that like for you when you're standing on the sidelines and you've been beyond the sidelines investing your own time and your own money 
to share these the stories of these creatures. What is it like for you watching this play out? It's absolutely devastating. It's but we can turn it around. So that is the hope that I cling to, and that's why I made the film. You know, we, we can if we act now, we can do something about this. But if we continue to go, yeah, who cares? Then then nothing will change. And Bill, when we are talking about the red-tailed cockatoos and Carnaby's cockatoos found in the Perth Pill region, Jane mentioned that some have been forced out into the Mangara Pines area and some have adapted to eating pine cones. I was watching some munching away uh, in some of the pine trees on campus at, at Curtin this morning. How is adaptability key to the ongoing survival of many of our native species? Well, that's a really interesting question, and it's something which I'm particularly interested in how animals become adapted to urban environments. And it's true, here on Curtin campus, we can see right outside our office um, cockatoos feeding on pine trees. And that's very interesting because we think of them as, as uh, uh, co-evolved with uh, the uh, native plant species here. But many animals will adapt. Many animals will start using resources which we provide other food sources and things like that. And um, red-tailed cockatoos and cannabis cockatoos are quite good at eating other sources of food. But I think that raises some interesting questions which, which Jane touched on, which is, if we have this attitude which is, oh, we're going to make things better for the cockatoos by getting rid of pine trees because they're non-native vegetation, we can't do that until we've already replaced that food source with um, replanting native food sources. So we can't just sort of get rid of something and then hope that for 20 years they'll somehow muddle along until anything else we've planted has grown up. They're using that because they have to use it. Yes, they're, adapt they're adaptable, but if, they, if there was plenty of native vegetation, they, they wouldn't be using it. So it's adaptability by it's necessity. It's adaptability by necessity, as it were, yeah. Jane, you co-wrote, directed and produced Black Cockatoo Crisis, a feature documentary that looks at the plight of WA's black cockatoos. The film has collected 15 international awards so far. What motivated you, and you touched on this earlier, but what motivated you to make this documentary? Yeah, look, the more I found out about um, black cockatoos, the more concerned I became. And when I'd finished, I came out of finishing another film called Cry the Forest, where we looked at logging and, and the impact of our core on our forest. Um, and the, the name of that film, Cry the Forest, was the cry of the red tail. Um, and uh, having, finished that campaign and, and it was successful. People took action and they and the government changed its mind and stopped logging. So social impact documentaries do work and, and community pressure does work. Um, so having seen that, I thought, well, you know, we've still got these cockatoos and, and um, we've still got our co in our forests. We've still got Nangara pines falling. We've still got massive road deaths. Um, we've still got pesticide poisoning. So how do we put that together and tell the story of biodiversity loss that we're watching, you know, on our watch in my lifetime? Um, so um, I started off when, when I heard that there was going to be a campaign about this, um, you know, offering to do a five minute short film. But as soon as I started filming these birds and I looked in the editing suite at their beauty, at their character, uh, at their cadence in their movement, you know, everything about them, I was smitten. Um, and I wasn't before, you know, um, I'm, I love all creatures, but there's something about the black cockatoo that is just amazing, especially the carnabies. Um, and so I, I realised that for, for people to fall in love with this bird on screen, it needed, it needed time and, and time to tell the story, time to engage with the birds and lots and lots of visuals. And so that's what I set out to do, to, to remind everyone that these special creatures that we stop in the street and we look up, you know, when you see them close up and when you learn about their personalities and you hear them and you experience them, they're so magnificent and, and what are we doing? It's a rich answer. They are, there's something about them that is so majestic in the way they move, the way they sound, all of it. What was that experience like? Jane actually going out and filming and gathering and collecting their story and the vision along with it? Oh, look, absolute privilege, but also a very difficult task. Um, 
it took me months and months to work out how best to film them. Because, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a journalist by trade and I've only just come to filmmaking in the last few years. Um, and, you know, wild, you know, I haven't got, I'm no David Attenborough. So I had to learn how to, how to make the most of these birds. And, uh, you know, the more that I learned, the more in love with these creatures I became and, and, and engaged in the community that is trying to save them. We have in the Nangara Pines the mega roost. Now that a mega roost is a gathering of up to 5,000 Carnaby's cockatoos, the largest gathering left on the planet, and they're meeting in this in these pine plantations. And this is something that Bill might be able to elaborate on, but there's something going on with these mass gatherings. It's just this cacophony of noise. Um, and the, the film starts off with that a few minutes of just um, audio uh, in the pine trees of this noise. And I was waiting for it to come down, but it didn't. And we were getting covered in ticks and mozzies and, you know, so we had to leave. But, um, yeah, this special, special place, these birds are talking and communicating. And you see them in the morning as they fly off and they're going different ways. And they're coming back, not to the same spot, to somewhere else. So their level of communication must be so intense. And what BirdLife told me while I was, while I was filming was that um, we could get to a stage where, because they're so independent, interdependent, because they're so social, that we, when we get to really low numbers, we will reach a tipping point and the old knowledge and the new knowledge will be gone and the population won't sit at a comfortable level. It will completely crash because they need to know in the landscape where the water is, where the food is. And that's how they're learning about pines. They're passing on that knowledge. I mean, you'd be able to... No, I agree. I, th I also agree with you that smitten is the word when you start getting to know these animals. But many, many flocking birds, uh, it, the implication is that one of the reasons they flock at night is not just because of anti-predator stuff, but when you get these mega roosts, it's also about social information exchange. So you, you, made the, you made the point that when they fly away, they're often flying away in different groups. And, and that's exactly it. There's often an exchange of information about where food is, where water is, and they're not necessarily in, the, in talking to each other in the way that we do, but they're, they're following individuals from whom they've picked up cues. So mega roosts are hugely important. We've got one mega roost left. Who knows in the past, there may have been multiple mega roosts of these birds with, with, with multiple exchanges of information and then birds moving between these roosts. And that intro introduces an interesting point as well, which I've noticed firsthand is that telling people that these are endangered species sometimes doesn't work because they're so visible and so loud and they fly around our city that people go, yeah, but they're common. Yeah, they're, they're common. So a flock of 20 flies over makes a dramatic noise and a dramatic sight. A hundred years ago, that flock would have been five or six times as big and there would have been multiple flocks. And we don't see that because we weren't around a hundred years ago, but we see this flock of loud dramatic birds. We think, well, they're fine. They're everywhere. They're, they're common. So it's this uh, slow incremental wearing away of the baseline, which is uh, where we start going, well, that's acceptable to have 100 instead of 500. It's acceptable to have 50 instead of 100. And it goes further and further down. And uh, that's why I think it's very shocking when you uh, to tell people, uh, the, the reaction from people when you say, yes, but with the decline, these are going to be gone before 2050. And many people simply don't believe that because they're around and they're visible and they're in your face. I mean, that is one of the problems for the cockatoo is is that I'm seeing it, therefore it's not happening. That's a bit like the same argument with climate change. For years we put up with that, oh, but it's cold, the planet's not warming. You know, it's that kind of mentality that we've got to get over. But also, you know, you, you protect these species and they're an umbrella species, so you protect the entire habitat uh, and, and the creatures that rely on that same habitat, the less popular ones, the little orchids, the little cute furry things that we hardly ever see. Um, so this is a story not only for the cockatoos, but this is, you know, a biodiversity issue. And have you seen that, Jane, um, you know, your documentary being able to cut through some of that taking for granted of this species? Absolutely. You know, people have left the film in tears. Um, but, you know, I, I go to most of the screenings and I do Q&As and I say, you know, don't get upset, don't get angry, get active. 
you know, this is, you're feeling this way because we have to tell the story. Um, but if we do nothing and if we continue to take these animals for granted, they'll be gone. And, and it's, again, much before 2050, I believe. You know, with our Bodans, there's only 4,000 of those left on the planet and they are being shot out of the sky illegally um, by orchardists. So we've got, you know, another, you know, multiple attacks on these species of, of, of birds. We're just going to pause for a quick break. We'll be back right after this message. Are you interested in a research degree? At Curtin University, we'll help you build knowledge in your profession and turn your discoveries into real world outcomes. You'll benefit from resources and support across areas like agriculture and environment, defence and healthy communities. Our commitment to innovative research has seen 95% of our projects rated at or above world standard in the latest ERA results. Learn how your research could make an impact at curtain.edu forward slash research. And we're back. Bill, I wanted to ask you, uh, what actions are actually happening or do you think need to happen to ensure WA's black cockatoos don't become extinct? Well, we're not taking a very coherent approach to trying to conserve these, these birds. And uh, as Jane has said, the, the major issue, and this is true for, 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 for many of our species, not just birds, is, is land clearance. Um, and I know people will talk about, and, and here at Curtin we do lots of work on restoration of landscapes. Uh, restoration of landscapes, however, happens at such long-term scales that often, um, even if we do successfully restore landscapes, we, we, have, it, we have issues uh, with keeping the animals there in the, in the time in between. So our, our, our um, Jarrah forest has been heavily logged in the past and has regrown but we've lost the really, really big trees in there. Um, and if we continue to cut down um, remaining big trees, those big trees are the ones that have hollows in. And it takes a long time for hollows to develop in trees. And those hollows are absolutely crucial for the continued breeding success of black cockatoos. So there's some very interesting things like uh, uh, white-tailed black cockatoos breeding on the ECU campus and the Murdoch campus when they've put up uh, uh, cocky tubes. Uh, for them to use. Uh, those are great ideas, really fantastic. Those are the sort of things we do, but those are sticking plasters over the big wound. And what we really need is we need to conserve land and we need to stop clearing land. So um, uh, leaping ahead to a point I know you want to ask me about, which is about the extinction of animals in Australia. We, we Unfortunately, we have the world record for for wiping out species. We've lost so many species of mammal and we continue, and part of that is because we have things like cats and foxes introduced in the past, but we continue to clear land and that is the biggest issue. Um, there are some bright spots, which is that animals can adapt to altered landscapes, but not all animals can. And do, do we really want to live in a degraded landscape anyway? I mean, do we not want to conserve some of these, these fantastic landscapes? And as Jane said, these are umbrella species. If you start saying, right, we're going to conserve Bodan's cockatoos very, very um, deliberately looking for what they need. One of those things they need is big old trees with big old hollows in to breed in. And if we do that, then we can serve all the forest around that. This has been touched on throughout our chat together, but how unique and special are these birds? Well, the, the, the Western cockatoos, the um, Red-tailed cockatoos, uh, various subspecies are found all across uh, Australia. We have one specific subspecies down here. Our white-tailed cockatoos are not found anywhere else. Um, they're uh, related to the uh, yellow-tailed cockatoos over east, but they've been separated by the aridification of the continent. And what's really interesting about the white-tailed cockatoos is they're just beginning to split into two species. Uh, so they're genetically very similar, but they're behaviorally different. They, they feed slightly differently. Someone described the, the way, for instance, bodans eat um, nuts is much more surgical than the way um, uh, uh, carnivores do because they have this much longer beak. They also require slightly different nesting habitats and roosting habitats and things. So they're just beginning to split into two species. They're about like a million year separation, which is a really interesting natural experiment to be seeing going on. And the fact that we're like wading in and then <laughs> kind of like uh, stamping out those species is, is, adds to the tragedy. Jane, on that, uh, are there any moments for you 
that really stand out in the filming experience when you were out with them capturing their story? Oh, so many. But um, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, in a, in a sort of really dramatic example of the loss of, of individual species from the population, um, I filmed um, on the south coast a stretch of highway um, where, you know, I, I got a lot of reports of dead birds and, and, you know, the public were coming to me and saying, what's going on down there? So I, I went down with my camera and I, I filmed this dramatic and devastating um, death of a carnaby right in front of my camera before I'd even focused. Um, and um, uh, it just, just being knocked out by a car and I didn't know what was going on. Um, I found out later that grain was being spilled, just tiny bits of grain, little bits of canola um, spilt in, in a trickle, like a, you know, breadcrumbs um, uh, along the highway by trucks that are unsealed. They're, you know, they're covered, but then they're not pulling out, you know, like uh, when you order compost from Bunnings or something, you get a great big pile. It's not like that. It's, it's, it's almost um, impossible to see. Um, so here's something that we could do for these hungry cockatoos immediately and simply um, to is make sure that every grain truck that left a farm or um, a, you know collection point was clean um, was sealed you know you get round with your little brush pan and you get all the bits over the edge because it's that those tiny tiny specks um, you know that's just legislation and and not only would we be saving our black cockatoos, also, you know, our mallee fowl, they've also falling fowl, um, as are our galahs and many, many birds that we're losing this way. Um, so this is, uh, this is the low hanging fruit. So that, that struck me as there is an answer. Just the same with the Bodans, they're being shot out of the sky by orchardists. Now, if we made all orchards netted, we would immediately solve that problem because the birds can't get under the nets and the, the fruit is preserved from other things as well, like frost. But we're not subsidising the netting as much as we should be. In Queensland, there's far more netting of orchards than in Western Australia. So there's, there's two simple things that legislation and government action tomorrow could change. Um, and, and we could say, put an immediate moratorium on the, on the Angara pines. So, you know, the, I, I guess whilst I loved these birds and I had great experiences, what struck me, getting back to your question, <laughs> um, segueing back, is really that there is an answer to all of this. You know, I, I, I grew up with um, seeing, you know, Bob Geldof go around the world and tell everybody, tell the world leaders, don't give me any more excuses, just like we're seeing Greta Thunberg now. The ability for certain people to cut through and get action, and that's what we need to do here. We need to stop listening to the excuses at why we can't do things and just get out there and do these simple things that are going to ensure the, the, the well, give the birds a chance. With climate change, they might be doomed anyway, um, but we can do things, I believe, in time uh, to make the population more resilient, to preserve the numbers, to protect the habitat. A clear message to policymakers: what are some of the in things that we could do as individuals potentially to help black cockatoos? Is there anything that we can do? Oh, so much. I mean, one the thing I tell people at screenings is go and talk to your MP. So this is a this is a, a an upwards, you know, from the bottom up campaign. Um, so that's what the first thing that people could do. But they can also plant a tree. Plant anything um, will increase biodiversity, even a nasturtium, you know, or some other sort of pretty flower. It doesn't matter as a plant. Um, I, of course, natives are better, but basically we need to increase the insect populations. We need to increase the, the greenery, um, it, all food sources, plant a nut tree for the cockatoos. Um, we are moving into a, um, a development down south um, in a paddock, it's not being cleared. But right now, they're, yeah, the street trees that they're putting in are um, macadamias. So there are so many small things that we can do as individuals. And, and Murdoch University has just raised 
um, screened the film and raised fifteen thousand dollars so far, but probably even more, for um, cockatoo watering stations that were designed by um, Victoria Park Council. Um, and these amazing things, so these amazing structures, could be popping up all over the place in appropriate positions that are safe for the birds to supply that constant clean water um, and re that reliable clean water are safe from cats and cars. Bill, I could see you nodding along a fair bit to a lot of Jane's points there. What was coming to mind for you? I think um, uh, Jane makes some very, very good points that um, particularly about ultimately this is going to come down to policy and legislation. And all through my life, I've heard the constant story that if you can just make people love this particular species or know about that particular species, then it's going to be safe. And that's true to a certain extent, and that's exactly what this film is doing. But ultimately, the decisions are made by people who are in power. Come, the decisions come from the top down. So there has to be pressure put on them. There has to be, well, there's no excuse to say, well, yes, it's going to cost money to subsidize nets on farms. It has to be done if you want to keep cockatoos. And if um, policymakers are not prepared to do that, that to me suggests that they are not serious about um, um, biodiversity conservation. What about the cultural significance of these birds? Yeah, in the film, we talk to um, you know cultural custodians, and f you know for forty thousand, sixty thousand years, these birds have been living harmoniously um, with First Nations people. Um, they are, are greatly respected and many um, people have them as a totem. Um, so, um, yeah, the feathers have great cultural significance. So, uh, but to each, to each group. So I can't, I'm, I'm not First Nations, I can't speak for that. But I, from what I learned and, and from doing the film and from interviewing First Nations people, these birds are um, particularly precious. Bill, I'd love to know what actually inspired you to work in environmental conservation? Oh, I think a similar story to many people. I, I started off being like a, a nerdy child that was um, always like in ponds or in woods or whatever, and, like, and catching things and finding things and uh, you know getting into trouble. Um, and then um, having done my degree in zoology and, and done my PhD, it soon became evident that yeah, it's really interesting to, 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 to go and see different parts of the world and go and see different organisms. But ultimately, everywhere, the recurring theme is uh, a decline in biodiversity. So if we can start doing, if we can contribute individually in any way towards that, that's what drove me to, to, to move more into the uh, questions about conservation. Uh, and again, it's just one person, and I real and like I said before, ultimately it comes down to uh, policy decisions. But anything we can produce, anything we can do, just as Jane has done, which will which will affect policy making, that's the important thing to do. And for you, Jane, I also had a very rich career, twenty five years as a as a journalist at least. Um, why this space? Oh, look, this space I've always been there. I was also the you know, running barefoot through the banksias. Um, but the Cary Forest was for me, What I just love the Cary Forest, absolutely love it. And we spent, my parents were teachers, so we spent a lot of time down south because we had all those school holidays. Um, and I saw on the news one night, when I was about 14, that they were wood chipping the Cary Forest. And that overnight turned me into an environmental activist. I started skipping school to go to, to protest marches and, and getting arrested by the time I was 18. And um, and and I so I've, I've come from that. That's that's my my heart is really. It's like we're part of history and we have to do something. And I think once you get that, um, once that's in your blood, you can't let it go. And you have to. You know, there, there's for me, there's actually not a choice but to keep going. Um, yeah, I'm I'm absolutely driven to give a voice to the creatures and the planet that on which we all survive. And I want my children to see a black cockatoo and, and my grandchildren, great-grandchildren, you know, and everybody's great-grandchildren. Thank you, Jane and to Bill as well, for coming in today and sharing your time and expertise and helping to really draw attention to the, the plight of this beautiful species. Thank you. Thank you.
You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. As always, if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it. And don't forget to subscribe to The Future Of on your favourite podcast app. Bye for now.